Thanks for plugging in and rethinking a dollar. I'm excited to have my guest, Michael Snyder from the Economic Collapse Blog.com, sit down with us today to discuss his book, The Beginning of the End. I'm sure you're going to find us to be very informative and right on time. Click the subscribe button below for more RTD interviews as well as monetary news updates. Enjoy. Welcome to Rethinking a Dollar. Today I'm excited to have my guest, Michael Snyder. He's the publisher and editor of a popular website, the Economic Collapse Blog.com. Today he's sitting down with us to discuss his book, the beginning of the end, and his most recent book that he co-authored, Get Prepared Now. Uh, Michael is a graduate of the University of Florida Law School, and he has worked as an attorney in the heart of the Washington, D.C. area for a number of years. On his website, Michael writes commentary on various subjects involving the global economy, such as the financial markets, the banking sector, as well as uh, just government policies in general. So, Michael, welcome to Rethinking a Dollar. It's great to be with you. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, I uh, appreciate you taking the time. I know you're, you're a busy man, and I was just on your site this morning, and it seems like you're doing a good job covering the whole Greek fiasco uh, with the whole uh, the, the bailout package and things like that. So looking to dive into that towards the middle of the interview, but uh, I want to cover your book, The Beginning of the End. I uh, came across that book and definitely thought it was something worthwhile. And what better source than get the author himself on to uh, you know give us some feedback and, and your thoughts behind writing that book. Yeah. Uh now, most people are familiar with my website, the economiccollapseblog.com, where I, I lay out in article after article kind of the evidence and the case for the coming uh, financial collapse, the problems that are coming with the U.S. dollar and, and the hard times that are ahead. But a lot of times, the general public, they're not patient enough to sit down and read something about economics or, or whatever. But, you know, in our society today, we're so addicted to entertainment. You know, one recent study found that the average American spends about 10 hours a day plugged into something, whether it's television, whether it's radio, movies, video games, their smartphones. So we're always plugged into something. We always need entertainment to, mm -hmm. to, to feed our minds with this, this entertainment. And, uh, and, of course, more than 90% of that entertainment is uh, controlled by just six giant media corporations who kind of feed us uh, all of this entertainment. But what I wanted to do is I wanted to take the truth, so many of the things that I've learned in, 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 in researching these things all these years, and I wanted to put it in a fictional format, in an entertaining format. And, and that's what I've done with the beginning of the end. I created a novel, a, a mystery slash thriller, which is, is, is very entertaining. Some people said, man, I got it. I, I read it in 48 hours because I couldn't put it down. I just loved it that much. But throughout the book, in virtually every single chapter, I've included what I call truth bombs, where what I've tried to do is include so much fact, so much information, and then paint a picture, which I'm not able to do in my normal articles, but paint a picture of what's coming. And what I believe we're right actually on the verge of. I wrote this book a few years ago to kind of paint a picture of what was coming in the future of America. Now I believe we stand right at the door of it. Right. In fact, just a few weeks ago, on my website, I released an article, and this was before things started blowing up with Greece and China and Puerto Rico and all the rest of it. But I back toward the end of June, I released an article uh, in, in which I declared a red alert. I've never done this before in 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 all of uh, uh, ever since I started the economic collapse blog in 2009. I've never issued a red alert for a specific period of time where I I'm saying that I believe a financial crisis is imminent in the last six months of mm -hmm. 2015. Now, I'm not saying it's going to happen within the next couple of weeks necessarily, or I'm not saying that it's going to be over at the end of 2015, because I believe 2016, 2017, we're headed for some massive problems. But I believe that the next great wave, just like we saw in 2008, the next great wave of the financial crisis is coming. It's imminent. Mm -hmm. And so I released that uh, just a couple of weeks ago here. But a couple of years ago, I wanted to paint a picture for, okay, what is that going to look like for people? What the times ahead, what, is, uh, what uh, you know, how is that going to look like for average people or, or, or here in the United States? And so that's what I've tried to do with this novel, The Beginning of the End, and, and people can find it on Amazon.com. But I wanted to paint a picture of, okay, when we have the derivatives crash, you know, when the stock market tanks, what is that going to mean for people in terms of unemployment, in terms of businesses shutting down, in terms of what things are going to look like in this country? Uh, and, and so that's what I've attempted to do with, with the book. Right. Now, before we dive even deeper to the book, I wanted to ask a couple of RTD questions. 
And the first one being, what comes to mind when you hear the words rethinking the dollar? Well, what comes to my, my mind is that most Americans don't even understand where money comes from. You know, they'll hold a, a dollar bill in their hand and they'll say, this is money, but what makes it money and where did it come from? You know, most Americans can't answer those basic questions. They don't realize that our money, you know, there's, no, there's nothing behind the U.S. dollar. There's nothing back. It's, it's fiat currency. It, 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 the only value that it has is because we, you know, use it and trade it with one another, but it doesn't really have any intrinsic value of its own. But, uh, yeah, and, and how it's created is it, it, it comes into existence uh, through debt. You know, the more debt that's created, the more money that's created is the way that our system works. And, and it goes back to the Federal Reserve and all that. And so we've got this debt-based system in which we continually have more money created with, and we continually have more debt created. And debt is always growing faster than money is. And eventually that leads to a crisis. Mm -hmm. And so we're seeing this in Greece. We're seeing it in Puerto Rico. In fact, there's about 20 nations around the world right now that are having a major debt crisis because uh, they all have central banks. They all have a similar system. In fact, today, more than 99% of the, of the world's population lives in a nation that has a central bank, similar to the Federal Reserve. Mm -hmm. And so we're on the same path that Greece was on. In fact, since the Federal Reserve was created in 1913, the value of the U.S. dollar of our currency has gone down by well over 96%. Meanwhile, the size of the U.S. national debt has increased by more than 5,000 times. Mm -hmm. So we've got just this endless debt spiral, and that, this, that's what our system is designed to do. It's designed to create an endless spiral debt from which our government can never possibly escape, endlessly creating more and more and more debt, and eventually it gets to the point, like we're seeing in Greece, where the debt's unpayable, the system starts collapsing, and there's a huge crisis. We're headed for the exact same thing. Right. Now, how important is it for you know, the public? Americans in general or citizens around the world to really begin taking an uh, interest in these matters? I think it's absolutely cru crucial because the crisis can build up over a long time. And, uh, you know, anyone that's lived off of credit cards knows that for a while it seems like everything's okay. You know, you're using one credit card to pay another, but, you know, things still seem kind of normal, but eventually a crisis point comes. And when it comes, it can mean everything. You look at what's happening in Greece today. The banking system's on the verge of collapse. People are going into the supermarkets, grabbing food and supplies, whatever they can, because they think, well, my currency, my, 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 you know, my bank account, it may, may soon disappear. My currency is going to potentially soon be transferred to drachmas and become worthless. And, you know, so they're like, we got to buy things while we still can. And, and there's chaos and unemployment's over 25%. And, uh, you know, it, it, the whole society, the whole economy is grinding to a halt. And, and similar things are coming here. It's just a matter of time. Mm -hmm. And so people need to understand, because I believe there's hope in understanding what's happening and hope in getting prepared for what's coming. So, you know, the people who are going to be giving in to fear and depression and be totally going crazy when the next crisis comes are the people who don't understand any of this who don't see the next crisis coming. When it comes, they're going to be totally unprepared for it, and they're going to freak out because no one, of course, the mainstream media is not explaining any of this. They, they, you know, the, 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 the politicians, the vast majority of them, aren't explaining this to them. So they're going to totally not understand what's happening. They're going to be blindsided by what's coming. So that's why it's so important that people understand these things. Right. Now, to hone in now, if you were asked to give uh, the global state of the economy address, you were at the podium, all cameras globally was focused in on your, you know, quick little summary or speech. Give us uh, a paint a picture for us of, of what we're facing and what, 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 what should we do? Well, the, one of the biggest problems we're facing as a global financial system today is all this debt. It's everywhere. The world has never been in more debt today. The, the debt to GDP ratio of all debt for the entire world, it's, it, the ratio of debt to GDP is 286%. It's never been higher. So we've reached a crisis point. 
but just trying to do something, some deal like they're doing in Greece to try to make the debt sustainable and kick the can down the road, that doesn't solve the problem. Because uh, what we need to do is get at the root, which is this central banking system, which is this system of money creation, which creates debt. Debt, it, it, the, our entire system is based on debt and the creation of debt and the continuation of debt. And so until that's addressed, there's never going to be any type of, of uh, permanent solution. So dealing with how money is created and dealing with this debt-based syst based system is absolutely critical. And then the other part of it is the financialization of the, of the global system where we've got this system where, you know, we've, we heard in this last crisis, 2008, about too big to fail. We've got these too big to fail banks and we, they promised us they would do something about it. The politicians all say, yeah, we're going to fix this problem. Well, here in the United States, since the last crisis, the too big to fail banks have gotten 40% larger collectively. Meanwhile, 1,400 smaller banks have completely disappeared from the system. Right. So that means the problem of too big to fail is now bigger than ever. Yeah. Meanwhile, since the last crisis, these too big to fail banks, you think they would have learned since the last time around? No, instead they've gotten become more reckless. That you know, Wall Street has become transformed into the biggest casino in the history of the world. And so we've got these uh, giant banks which are, are just gambling like crazy, in particular with derivatives. I, can, I can't say that word enough. And a lot of people say, oh, derivatives, that sounds very, very complicated. And they can be very complex and complicated, but at their core, they're just basically uh, wagers. It's a form of legalized gambling, kind of like if you went to Las Vegas and you bet that either the Chicago Cubs would win the World Series or not, Either it's going to happen or you're not. You're going to win money or you're going to lose money. That's essentially at their heart what derivatives are. You're not investing in anything real. Like when you buy stocks, mm -hmm. you're buying equity, you're buying an ownership interest in a company. Or if you're buying bond, you're buying the debt of a company. But derivatives, you're just gambling on whether something is going to happen in the future or not. And these big banks, these too big to fail banks, the five largest ones in the country, I'm talking about uh, J.P. Morgan Chase, Goldman Sachs, um, Bank of America, um, Morgan Stanley, banks like that, the five biggest each have exposure to derivatives in excess of $35 trillion. Hmm. But their, uh, their total assets are only a small fraction of that. Uh, you know, like the biggest one of them all, J.P. Morgan Chase, has uh, total assets of less than $3 trillion. So when you're talking about $35 trillion, $40 trillion, $50 trillion, dollars which some of these banks have exposure to derivatives you're talking about an amount of money that's almost unimaginable keep in mind the u.s national debt which is absolutely insane is 18 trillion dollars so these big banks have exposed themselves to this legalized form of gambling and most of the time they do well when things are stable and normal their computer algorithms work very well and they make money but when things start turning against them, we have black swan events, markets start crashing, markets start going crazy like we saw in 2008. All of a sudden, the computer algorithms don't work anymore. And, and like we saw Lehman Brothers crashed back in 2008. We saw AIG get in huge trouble back in 2008. It was because of derivatives. And I believe a great derivatives crash is coming. It, it threatens the whole world. In fact, the bank with the most exposure, about $75 trillion, is actually over in Europe. It's in Germany. Deutsche Bank, and, and so this is a crisis I believe we're right on the verge of. I believe that uh, the whole global financial system is going to be shaken by it. We're going to see some of these too big to fail banks actually fail. Mm -hmm. And since the whole global financial system is based on the flow of credit and debt, just think about it. If you want to buy a home, you need a mortgage. You want to buy a car, you need an auto loan. You know, we all, uh, you know, if you want to go to school, you need a student loan. We all use our credit cards virtually all the time to buy what we need all of, and and where we get the majority of that credit is from the too big to fail banks all of a sudden if those banks fail we can't get credit we can't use our credit cards you know all of a sudden economic activity grinds to a halt so this is something that I portrayed in my book the beginning of the end and this is something I've been writing a lot about and this is something I believe we're right on the verge of okay now let's dive into the book the beginning of the end let's get into the storyline a little bit um, give us a, a brief synopsis of you know the storyline and when I guess the economic collapse happens. Some of the events that begins to unfold as people wake up to the reality uh, d during your book. 
Yeah, I've got a, a, a variety of characters in the book. I've got a CIA agent who then gets essentially selected to be a part of this uh, ultra, ultra uh, secret agency that no one even knows about um, uh, in the government. But then he makes all kinds of horrifying discoveries about what they're really up to. Um, but his path ends up crossing with a reporter who's, uh, you know, covering uh, certain things related to the financial crisis and everything else. Their paths cross and they start comparing notes and eventually they get tied up with this character uh, out in Montana who um, is actually a blogger, kind of similar to, to, to what I do, although I didn't portray that character after myself. But he, this blogger out of Montana, who's made some some discoveries, and and he gets involved with them, but and and uh, and uh, you know, and and they work to expose certain things, but then you know, uh, they get into huge trouble with 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 the government and everything else, and there's this great chase across the country. But all of this is in the context of a great financial collapse that starts happening. I talk about derivatives um, in the book. The beginning of the end and 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 how things start crashing there's a huge crisis and unemployment starts to go up and then we start to see civil unrest and eventually martial law is portrayed in the book and it's also in the context of natural disasters and other things that are happening so all leading up to a very very uh thrilling conclusion um and and there's so much stuff in there about the uh, big brother police state that we see going up all around us and the loss of our freedoms and liberties and so i try to tie all this all these things together into a, a very entertaining story but also something you can give to a family member or friend and say hey read this book and they're that they enjoy the book but then also maybe a light bulb goes on they start to wake up to certain things and so it's a way to share things with people but in a way that, uh, you know, it might be a little bit easier. Maybe they're a little more willing to accept. Right. Now, let's uh, get into some of, the, some, some of the events going on now and how it kind of relate, may relate to your, your writings at the beginning of the end, dealing with the whole Greece situation now. Are there any, you know, the crisis they're in now, it's a much smaller scale. Can you see it being similar to what might or could happen here um, on, on a global scale, surrounding the dollar and things like that? Oh, absolutely. Now, there, of course, there's some differences because here in the United States, the you know, Federal Reserve, you know, the, the U.S. government, the Federal Reserve, you know, we kind of control our own currency. While over there, the Greeks are dependent. They, they, they have no control over the euro, so they're dependent on, since they're flat broke, on, on people giving them euros. So there's some differences, but in so many ways, we're on the same tra trajectory that they are. But as for Greece, you know, I believe that this was a deal that was designed to fail because I believe that the Germans and their allies, see, they bailed out Greece once and didn't work. They bailed out Greece again. It didn't work the second time. And now they're being told, okay, you've got to pour a whole bunch more money into Greece in order to save them. Well, for the Germans, they've already given them so much money that it breaks down to about $780 per citizen that, the Germans have already given to Greece, and now they've got to give a whole bunch more. So the Germans are kind of like, you know, we got to think, find a way to end this. But Germany can't tell Greece, okay, you get out of the euro. I'm, I'm ordering you to get out of the euro. Germany can't, has no power to do that. Right. So what they've got to do is they've got to create the con create conditions that Greece cannot, never possibly meet, under which if they don't meet those conditions, they're out of the euro. And so I believe that this is what this deal is all about, saying, okay, Greece, we're going to help you one last time, but you've got to do all these things. But they've made the conditions so harsh, so completely unrealistic, so uh, so draconian that the goal that the Germans and their allies were hoping that the Greece people would say, no, we're not going to do this. We're going to walk away. There's no way we're going to accept this. Now we'll see what happens with the vote today. It looks like it might go through that they see the Greeks even though this deal is so horrible, they desperately want to stay in the euro and they desperately want money from the rest of Europe, the Europe to keep coming in because that's the only way they're surviving. That's the only way their banking system is not going to collapse. That's the only way their economy is not going to collapse is to get money from the rest of Europe. So they desperately want the, to stay in the euro and they desperately want to keep getting money from the rest of Europe. So they're, they, they're probably going to end up accepting this deal unbelievably 
But I think the Germans and, and their allies were hoping that the Greeks would reject it. So they could be like, okay, they want to leave. Okay, now, now they're out of Europe. Right. So if the Greek <laughs> parliament says, okay, we're going to accept this, then, uh, then, it's, then the shoe is going to be on the German parliament, the Finnish parliament, because they have to prove it too. Yeah. And so are, are the Germans and the Finns and so forth willing to go ahead and say, okay, we're going to, we're going to go ahead with this bailout. That's a big question. And then, of course, the IMF has come in, and they said, you know what? This deal is going to make Greek debt totally unsustainable, totally unpayable. There's no way they can do this. And the only way that we can be involved, the IMF, is if Greek debt is set on a sustainable path, which means a lot of Greek debt is either going to have to be forgiven or there's going to have to be monetary transfers to Greece on a permanent basis from other European nations. Something's got to be done for us to participate. But the Germans have already said that, that they're not going to participate in the deal if the IMF is not included, and so that creates a whole other thing. So there's so many ways this deal could end up falling apart. So we'll see what happens. Yeah. But I believe that this deal was designed to fail, that Germany actually wants Greece out of the Eurozone, but I think Germany greatly underestimates what this is going to do to Europe and to the Eurozone. I believe that the Eurozone, as we know it, is on its last legs, that we're going to see the breakup, we're going to see great chaos in Europe, and eventually, I believe, it will be reconstituted in a much more uh, cohesive form. That will ultimately, at the end of the road, be the solution. We'll see a new Europe, a more comprehensive Europe, brought together um, at the end of all this. But in the meanwhile, I believe that there's going to be great chaos. But I believe Americans should watch this because I believe there's great lessons that we can learn from this. Hope you enjoyed this conversation with Michael Snyder. Want to take a quick second to direct those Android lovers to the Google Play Store. We get a chance to download the RTD app to stay in tune with more interviews as well as monetary news. Enjoy the rest of this conversation. Thanks. All right now, it seems like, you know, debt is, is or will be the, the biggest subject of our lifetime. The fact that we're at the point uh, where it's unsustainable, and so they're trying to scramble to, you know, patch up holes here and there, where eventually it's just going to bust loose on everyone, to where there'll be nowhere to run, nowhere to hide, and everyone will be forced to come to the realization of what it is. Now, uh, one of the subjects that I just became introduced to is the whole idea of shamita. Like I was listening to some commentary not long ago about the whole idea of shamita. Can you give me uh, the the simple forms of what that is and how that plays into debt and things like that? Sure, absolutely. If you go back and you look in your Bible, um, that's where this comes from. It comes from the Old Test, the, the Old Testament, the, the Torah, the first five books of the Bible. And uh, in the first five books of the Bible, God commanded the people of Israel every seven years there was supposed to be a land rest in which there would be no sowing, no reaping. The land was to rest. But that wasn't all. There, it was also a time of uh, debt forgiveness. At the end of the seventh year, there was supposed to be a release. That's where the word Shemitah comes from, a release of debts. And so, you know, you wouldn't have this accumulation of debts where they become unpayable and all that. Um, so it was kind of a built-in circuit breaker, if you will. And so a lot of people might be thinking, well, what in the world does that have to do with us today? Well, it has a lot to do with us, actually. And Jonathan Kahn has documented this in his recent book about the Shemitah. And we've seen this pattern of, of every seven years, which, you know, of course, we don't, we haven't followed that pattern, which was prescribed in the Bible. And so every seven years on the Shemitah cycle, we've seen huge problems erupt, particularly in the last couple. If you go back to 2001, there was a Shemitah year which began in the fall of 2000, and it ended in the fall of 2001. And on the very last day of the Shemitah year, in September 2001, we had the greatest one-day stock market crash up until that time in all of U.S. history was on the 29th of Elul on the biblical calendar. The last day of the Shemitah year, the day calling for the releasing of debts, was the day the stock market crashed. And that record held for exactly seven years on the biblical calendar to, until we get to the next Shemitah cycle, began in the fall of 2007, ended in the fall of 2008. In September 2008, on the last day of the Shemitah year, on the 29th of Elul, we had the, once again the greatest one-day stock market crash in all of U.S. history 
and it still remains a record up to this day, 777 points on the 29th of Elul, the greatest stock market crash ever on the exact day calling for the releasing of debts, the very last day of the Shemitah year of that Shemitah cycle. So now we're in the new cycle, uh, 2014. Um, it began last fall, and it ends September 13th, 2015. Now, is the stock market going to crash on that day? No, because that actually falls on a Sunday this time. But as Jonathan Kahn pointed out, we're not necessarily looking at one specific day because sometimes it, it, it comes, uh, you know, big financial problems come a bit before or a bit after. For example, if you go back uh, a few cycles to 1987, we all remember Black Monday. Well, that came... Uh, just shortly after, within weeks after of the, the, the end of the, uh, the Shemitah cycle. So, uh, you know, we're coming up now. It's just a couple months away to the end of this Shemitah cycle. And a lot of people are wondering, well, what's going to happen? We've seen what's happened on the exact day in the last two, end of the last two Shemitah cycles. What's going to happen? And it just so happens that so many other things are coming together at this time, which are pointing to a great financial crisis. Um, and so this is just another indicator that seems to point to, wow, we could be heading for some real chaos in the months ahead. Yeah, wow, interesting. That's something really worth looking into, definitely. Now, the whole push for a cashless society, what's that about? And do you foresee us going to solely digital with the whole idea of a new world type of, you know, governance, things like that? Do you see a sole currency, digital currency coming? perhaps after this collapse or, you know, economy shift or what are your thoughts about that cash society? Well, I think that governments and bankers both love this because for government, it allows them to track everything. It's easier to collect taxes. It's easier to see what people are doing because every, there's a record of everything. It's not cash and it's credit cards. If it's bank cards, if it's whatever, then it's in a computer somewhere and governments can look at it and they can track it and they can crack down on crime or money laundering or like I said, collect taxes. So government bureaucrats tend to really be in favor of these kind of measures. And then banks, if it's got to be a cashless society and we've got to do everything through bank accounts, well, everyone's got to, got to put money in the banks. Everyone's got to work through them and work through their systems and use their credit cards, use their bank cards. So banks tend to be in favor of it as, as well. So, um, you know, we've seen a lot of bankers come out and talk about how we need to transfer to the system. And then countries around the world, whether it's Italy, whether it's France, in Europe, there's certain countries are starting to pass laws saying you can't use cash over a certain amount um, that's banned now for certain transactions. And, and they keep, in some countries, they keep lowering it or another Nations like Sweden has already almost gone, gone totally cashless, in which the whole system is, is, is everything set up. And in fact, certain things now, like you can't get on a bus and use cash, things like that. So they've already they have it banned cash in Sweden, but they set everything up so that you almost have to participate in the cashless system in order to get anything done. So we're seeing these movements take place. And it's uh, one step at a time. I don't think it'll be one giant step overnight, but they're, they're moving in this direction and they're slowly moving in the direction of, of making cash illegal. Even here in the United States where, you know, um, you know the, the Department of Homeland Security tells hotels, they say, okay, if someone comes in and pays cash for a hotel room, that's suspicious activity. <laughs> and so things like that are just discouraging people from using cash or, or what we've seen with these uh, structuring. IRS goes after people if they take out cash. You know, if, if you take out cash, of, I think it's over $5,000 at a time. It's got to be reported to the government. But if you take out cash at like $4,000 at a time in order to avoid those reporting requirements, well, they call that structuring. And they've actually put people in jail, like Dr. Kent Hovind, for example. They put people in jail for doing that. And so it really kind of frightens people away from using large amounts of cash. So all these things work together to try to start to push people in the direction of a, of a cashless system. So will we ever see cash completely disappear? I don't know, but I think that, uh, you know, we're certainly moving in that direction. 
Right. Now, you've done a good job of painting a picture of the fact that, you know, debt is a problem. And there's a lot of events that start to unfold that, you know, should by now have people concerned for their own livelihoods and their own finances and things like that. Now, to get into your most recent book briefly, uh, Getting Prepared Now. What is that about and what are some, uh, you know, why did you write that book? You know, one of the reasons I wrote that book is because, you know, there a few years ago, a number of years ago, 2010, 2011, 2012, so many people were into prepping. So many people were in, into getting prepared for the next crisis. But then we've kind of had a lull. We, there was like, and it's kind of uh, lulled people into a false sense of security where people think, well, maybe everything's going to be okay. It's, things seem kind of stable. Maybe the, maybe the problems were fixed. Maybe everything's going to be all right. Well, me and my co-author, Barbara Fix, we wrote that book to tell people, no, the crisis is coming. You need to get prepared now because it's imminent. And so that's why that word, I wanted to have that word now in there is because I believe if you wait, it's going to be too late to get prepared. But now is the time to be getting prepared, to be building up your emergency fund so that when things start going crazy, you can still pay your bills. So I'm a big believer in storing up food and supplies for having gold and silver for investment purposes, for getting your finances in order. So your, your retirement fund, your finances are not wiped out when the stock market crashes. For learning how to do practical things like how to garden, how to can food, how to safely store water, things that our grandparents understood how to do. People who went through the Great Depression understood but we've kind of lost those skills. So anything you can do to become more independent of the system, whether it's learning how to grow a garden, uh, you know, um, anything like that, uh, starting up a side business. So if you lose your job, you still have something to bring in some income. Um, anything like you can do to become more independent of the system, I think, is a good thing. And, and we've tried to outline some of those things in the book. All right. Well, as we draw towards the end of our discussion here, how has the uh, preparation uh concept been received on your end from your from your audience and family friends uh, are they convinced or are they like oh mike's just you know he's just you know oh, he's just crazy or what's the what's been what's been the 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 the, the feel you've been receiving so far well so many people you know once they understand what's happening and what's coming they want to get prepared and so they've been a lot of people have been thankful for the book and enjoyed the book and 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 of course i provide so much free advice on my websites that people can come and, and, and then I point to other resources that they can take advantage of. And, and a lot of people, you know, they, they email me privately and, and, and they're so thankful and they have additional questions. And so there are a lot of people out there who are awake, who are preparing, who are, uh, you know, aware of these things. But then there are others who are like, eh, no, it's not really going to happen. Our politicians have everything under control. Everything's going to be just fine. There is not going to be, yeah, there might be some downturns, but it's not going to be that bad. And so there, there are people even among my family and friends who aren't taking it seriously. And, you know, we try to warn them, but they're like, eh, no big deal. But you know what? When things start going crazy, who are they, where are they going to show up? They're going to come knocking on our door, you know? <laughs> um, and that's going to be the case with people in the audience today. And so, my wife and I were preparing for that, not just for ourselves, but also, you know, for people that are preparing, for friends and family members, what are you going to do when someday they show up at your door, knocking on the door, and they say, okay, we know you prepared, you got to help us. Are you going to turn your family and friends out into the street? I couldn't do that. Right. So my wife and I were making preparations right. for being able to take care of others, too, in addition to ourselves. And so... That's a little bit more of a burden, but I feel like that's what we've got to do because not a, you know a lot of people are not going to wake up until the shaking starts to happen. Now I believe that's imminent. We're right at the door, um, and and that's why I've issued this unprecedented warning about the last six months of this year because I believe we're heading into it now. And for a lot of people, it's going to be too late to prepare, too late to to do much about what's coming. Um, but it's, it's here, it's right at the door. And so I'd encourage everyone to get prepared while they still can, because I believe it's going to get progressively worse and we're going to be in for quite a roller coaster ride. And it's not just going to be economic. It's not just going to be financial, but it's, it's been described as a perfect storm. 
And I believe that's exactly what we're heading into. All right. Well, Michael Snyder, I appreciate you sitting down and sharing your work with us. Give the audience a, a way to stay in touch with what you have going on also to be a blessing to you. Yeah. The easiest ways to find me, the, the website I'm most known for is the Economic Collapse blog. If you uh, go to Google and type in the Economic Collapse, it's the first result that comes up. Um, I also write for a website call, uh, called End of the American Dream. You can find it at endoftheamericandream.com on that website. I address a broader variety of issues and perspectives than I do on the Economic Collapse blog. And then when we've been talking about my books today, the novel, The Beginning of the End, and the book about preparing for what's coming, Get Prepared Now, they can both be found on Amazon.com. And then I've also got a couple of new DVDs that just came out. I just recorded in April. And the one is entitled Economic Collapse, World War III, um, and the Death of America. In that DVD, I attempted to... Uh, 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 provide a roadmap for what I believe is going to happen between now and what I believe is coming uh, in the future of America over these next few years, the most comprehensive roadmap I've ever come across. And you can also find that DVD and my other DVD that I just did uh, on my websites. Sounds good. Michael Snyder, thanks for joining us. Look forward to us definitely staying in touch with your work, and I'll continue to follow your blog. Thank you for joining us. Oh. Thank you so much for having me on. I appreciate it. Well, this concludes my discussion with Michael Snyder. Hope you found this conversation to be very informative as well as educational. I want to encourage you to get a copy of his book, The Beginning of the End. Just scroll down below to the RTD Bookstore where you'll have access to the Amazon link right there. Also, I would love to hear your thoughts about this interview. Leave us a comment. And if you also find us to be informative and want to share it, feel free to do so. And also, I want to direct you to the RethinkingAdollar.com where you have a chance to test your money IQ as well as get a copy of my free ebook, The Simplicity of Money. And visit me on Facebook. Give me a thumbs up there. I share monetary news daily there. Looking forward to bringing you more interviews. See you later.